Thank you, creature. That's very nice. Okay. Alrighty, welcome back to Solution Land. Uh, we just have a few more things to talk about. This chapter is actually really short, which is nice because because uh, the next chapter is not. So <laughs> uh, it'll be fun. We'll have a happy time doing this stuff. So uh, there's a number of various uh, concentration terms we're going to talk about today. Um, some of which you'll be familiar with, maybe some not so much, but uh, we'll still talk about them regardless. Um, and so concentration is kind of like, dare I say, the most important part of a solution, knowing how much you have uh, dissolved uh, in, your, in your solvent. Um, at least in my opinion, it is. Uh, and so there's a lot of different kind of units that we would use uh, when talking about these. A couple that we've uh, seen before, of course, the m most common like of all would be molarity, which is a capital M. Which is our moles of solute over our liters of solution. Uh, probably, again, the most common one you're going to see in chemistry. Uh, very, very common there. But um, in biology, uh, they tend to use other units. Um, so in kind of just like general chemistry and that sort of thing, we use molarity the most, by and large, by far. Um, you'll see that other ones would be um, mass percent which is abbreviated percent weight per weight. Uh, that would be the mass of the solute over the mass of the solution. You have other mass percents in there. Um, you have percent weight per volume, which would be your mass of solute over your volume of solution. Uh, either that's going to be uh, liters or milliliters. It just depends what your, uh, since it's percent, you want your units to cancel out. So you would want them to be, um, they are not going to cancel out, but you want them to be similar. Like if you're using grams, you'd want to use um, uh milliliters for example we also have mass percent i'm sorry uh you have volume percent which is percent volume per volume and that would be the volume of solute over volume of solution this would be something uh where you would uh, see like alcohol is reported this way. So uh, your vodka that says 40% alcohol by volume, that would be a volume percent where you have 40 mLs of ethanol for every 100 mLs of solution. So you'd have 60 mLs of water, right? Uh, something like this would be normal saline solution where you'd have... Uh, nine grams of salt dissolved in a liter of water and then the mass percent uh this is one that is i mean of the mass percents this would be the most common one in chemistry uh like if you have 10 percent sucrose solution you're doing an osmosis experiment solution sorry Uh, that's me being lazy and not wanting to write out the entire word. So I skipped the UTO and to put, a, put an apostrophe there. Um, so those would be, um, oops. You would uh, use these percents in various uh, different um, circumstances, but by and large, you don't usually see those in chemistry. But they are valid you know, means of measuring concentration. Uh, cool. Uh, you have another one called molality, 
which is something just to, to mess with people. Um, it's actually pretty useful for uh, one particular thing we're going to be discussing later today, but that's kind of it. Uh, it's used for one thing and one thing only. Um, it's abbreviated with a cursive M, uh, which I will have as kind of this squiggly thing. And that one is going to be your moles of solute over your kilograms of solvent. So most of these have solution as their denominator term, uh, but for molality, uh, it's solvent. So that's an important distinction there uh, that we're going to see uh, is important. We have mole fraction. which is x. That's going to be your moles of solute over your total moles. Uh, so remember, just like we had, um, we talked about mole fraction when we did gas laws. It's the same thing here. It's the moles of whatever you're looking at over the entire moles. Uh, you know, in fact, instead of solute, because sometimes we use it for solvent, moles of interest <laughs> whatever you're looking at so whatever component you're looking at um, the moles of that uh, over the total moles uh, i'm just going to put a whatever a happens to be so the mole fraction of a is just your moles of a whatever that is over your total moles We'll, we'll do some examples with these in a bit, but we have two more to go over. We have parts per million. Which is... Uh, one part per million would be one gram over 10 to the sixth grams, whatever that happens to be. Typically, this would be of your solution, and this would be your solvent. Um, parts per million, so there's just one thing in a million. So if you're looking at milligrams, you can do it uh, another way. That would be the same thing as saying one milligram per uh, liter if uh, with dilute solutions. If your solution is dilute, it's going to have a density similar to water. Remember that water, one kilogram, is the same as one liter. So if your solution is dilute, one liter of your solvent is approximately... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I did say solute, didn't I? My bad. Thank you, Kevin. Uh where you're looking at one milligram per liter. So when you see, uh, you know, your, your water report and it's telling you how much arsenic is in your water, uh, that's typically given in PPM. So that's telling you for, like, I think the most kind of useful way of talking about PPM is going to be this way, uh, where you have one milligram per liter. Uh, that's telling you you have, if, you know, you're reading your arsenic report and it says you have, you know, 13 PPM, that's the same as 13 milligrams uh, per liter so uh, of water. So that's what that would be. So one part per million is one gram over a million grams. That's technically its definition. But for a more practical definition, uh, we might say one milligram per liter for one part per million. Of course, you would have the same thing for parts per billion. is PPB. Uh, these are even smaller concentrations. That would be one gram over 10 to the ninth grams. Or um, more commonly, one microgram per liter. That would be one part per billion. Uh, so again, really small concentrations here. These would be something uh, you would see in more kind of analytical chemistry. So when you're looking at uh, the content of trace amounts of stuff, uh, whether that is uh, something in water quality or if you're testing for, you know, how much selenium is in this bagel or something, you would probably use parts per million or parts per billion there because these are very small concentrations. 
Um, and so for whatever reason, instead of describing them as molarity or whatever, we, we like to do them in terms of mass instead. So uh, that would be that. Parts per trillion also exists for really small quantities. Uh, and that would be, you know, 1 over 10 to the 12. So um, mostly, 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 we're going to focus on just a couple of these. We're going to see that this one, the mole fraction, the molality, and the molarity are going to be kind of the big three we're going to use. But technically, uh, we have all of these uh, as our options. So it's just showing you for whatever you know purpose you're using your solution for, um, there may be certain uh, concentration units that may be more applicable uh, to whatever your uh, enterprise is. So let's do some examples. Let's say I have... What's sucrose is molarity? 342 molar mass? Something like that. Yeah, I think that's right. 342. Um, mole. Uh, it dissolved in, let's say, 1300 ml of water. And we say that the final solution volume is 1350 ml. Let's just say that. Uh, let's go ahead and see. Let's do the following calculations. Let's do the molarity, the molality, and the percent weight per weight for this. Uh, you know what, let's do mole fraction as well. Let's do all of our favorite ones. Uh, obviously, this is going to be way more concentrated than it would be for uh, to use parts per million or something. Uh, probably not applicable here just because... Uh, actually, it would be really easy. It would be just 100 divided by uh, 1.3, right? So, oh, no, 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 no. It would be 100,000 divided by 1.3, so... Quite a big number. So let's not even worry about parts per million here. Let's calculate these four. So um, you do it while I do it, uh, just for the interest of time. We're going to see that all of these will presumably give us different numbers uh, when we do this. So the VF here, by the way, what I mean by that is the solution volume. So uh, unfortunately, solution volume is not the same as the amount of water you put in uh, plus the uh, solute because uh, when they dissolve together, uh, the volumes are not additive. Uh, in fact, even if you mix ethanol and water, if you mix 500 mLs of each one, you do not get 1,000 mLs at the end. You get like 970 uh, just because there are uh, attractive forces between them that cause things to contract. Uh, other ones might cause them to expand. So... Uh, Solution volume would be different than just the volumes of your components. Molecular weight or molar mass, uh, whichever way you want to talk about that. Uh, just did it for you rather than having you calculate the molecular mass yourself. So, okay, molar mass. I'll write that for you. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do the molarity first. So molarity is moles per liter. We do not have moles right away. Uh, so we should do that first. Let's go back to black. Remember going to moles. We would use our molar mass. Do if we do that, 100 divided by 342, we get 0 0.2924, let's say. Awesome. Kevin's already done it for us. That's moles. So the molarity would be 
that many moles divided by 1.3 liters. I'm sorry, uh, 1.35 liters, because this is volume of solution, my bad. And doing that, Kevin says we get 2.53, just three sig figs there, times 10 to the negative one molar, or 0 0.253 molar, whichever way you like. Uh, or if you're really crazy, why not 253 millimolar? Aha! All the same. None of these are different. So um, there we go. So convert your solute from grams to moles, uh, and then we can use our solution volume to figure out the molarity. Oh, -ho. Kevin has already lied to us on the very first day. Actually, this is the very second day, so I just lied to you. Now those are fixed. All righty. Oh, I see you flipped the fraction. Got it. Or you flipped the two components. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, with that uh, done, uh, we can move on to the next one. Of course, if there's any questions, throw them out there. We'll, we'll go through them. The molality of this one is going to be the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Remember, for water, a gram and a milliliter are the same. So 1,300 milliliters is the same thing as 1,300 grams. And so we would have 1.3 kilograms for our water. So the molality would be, we have our moles from before. We already did that calculation. So we're doing this one. We will get 0 0.225 moles per kilogram. Uh, or you can say, you know, put it in all these different terms. You could also say uh, 0.225 molal. This, these awful words. I don't know why they decided to make them. Let's make them so similar. Um, so you have molar, 0.217 molar, or 0.225 molal, uh, which is silly. Uh, interestingly, linguistically, uh, L and R are not that different. Um, and some languages treat them as the same letter, so it's just even worse that way. Just in my opinion, it's a terrible word to use. But anyways, that's how we would uh, do that one. Uh, what else were we doing with this nonsense here? Aha, percent weight per weight. Okay. That's going to be our mass of solute over the mass of solution. Notice that the mass of the solution is not the volume of solution, necessarily. That's going to be the mass of the solute plus the solvent. So we would have to use the mass of both of those there. So uh, I have to scroll back up. So we had 100 grams and then 1,300 grams. So that was 100 grams over 100 grams plus 1,300 grams. Remember, 1,300 mLs of water is 1,300 grams of water. So, aha, we've tricked Kevin, perhaps. And so doing this, uh, we get... Mm, that seems really small, Kevin. I don't trust your answer. You might be, um, oh, 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 okay. Because this is a percent, I guess we have to multiply by 100, right? So, because we, we hate doing that. Yeah, so uh, I get 
fourteen uh, percent, right? Percents we always have to multiply by a hundred because percents are silly that way. My bad. Uh, I kind of always forget that. So in decimal terms, it would be 0 0.0764, but in percent terms, it would be, wait, how did I get a different number than you? 100 divided by 1400? Let's do it. Yeah, Kevin, I'm getting 714. Double check yours. I mean, this is like two mistakes now, Kevin. I don't know that we can trust any of your numbers anymore. Is Tyler here out of curiosity? We need Tyler here to, to fix the uh, this wall calculator error. I like it. Uh, so sorry, let me fix these silly things. All of these horrible percents, we would all have to multiply by 100, right? Because percents are stupid. I'm I'm not a biologist. I don't like using percents, so... But there it is. So that would be our percentage for this particular one. The last one was mole fraction. And so that would be the moles of sucrose over the total moles. So just like how the um, mass of solution was the mass of solute and solvent, the total moles is going to be the moles of solute and solvent. So uh, we're going to have to take our water and convert that into moles first. Water, of course, has a molar mass of 18.02. So doing this, we get 72.14 moles of water. So our mole fraction would be, uh, where did the original moles go? 0 0.2924, okay. So we'd have to add up all of our moles there. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So 72.142 plus 0.2924. Uh, hmm. Let's see, I'm gonna have to move this out of the way. Actually, I should've Cut that, never mind. Here, we'll just put it down here. There we go, whatever. Okay, with this, uh, it's, oops. Since we're using different operations here, we're gonna have to worry about our sig figs a little bit more. Uh, added that together, you get 72.4344, but that's only significant to the uh, tens place. So we're still gonna end up with three sig figs, okay. So 0.2924 divided by 72.4344, we get 0 0.00689. That would be our mole fraction. Kevin, you're kidding me. How can we be getting such different answers? 0.2924 divided by, oh, oh, I did not, put the seven correctly. Oh, ho, 4036. Yay, we did get it right. Okay, that's good. Uh, actually, mine gives it to round out to 404, whichever way it's, it's fine. There's no units for mole fraction because you have moles over moles. So uh, we, we don't have a unit for that. So that's just going to be our answer there. So we would have that. Already, are, are we thoroughly, yeah, right? <laughs> three in a row, right? It's, it's got to be me, one of them, right? So I'm glad we, we fixed that. So have we had enough of solution units? You'll have plenty of those for homework, but uh, for right now, we can uh, go ahead and move on with our lives, I think. Anybody have any questions on any of these besides uh, Kevin and Mai's math problems? 
calculators are tough to use. We can finally talk about what we're going to do with these things. All right, well, if there's questions, go ahead and throw them up. Uh, we're going to have what are called colligative properties now. And these properties uh, depend on the amount of solute. So, um, you know, some properties are, you know, kind of fixed. Uh, colligative properties are not. So they will depend on how much solute you have. Um, and we're going to see that all of these will have uh, kind of important ramifications for us. So uh, with colligative properties, we have kind of four of them that we're going to talk about uh, here. Uh, in no particular order, but all of them will depend on the amount of solute, and we can use all of them to calculate the molar mass of an unknown substance. So, um, thankfully, with um, you know, kind of archaic chemistry, we're able to figure out molar mass through a number of uh, experimental methods, uh, and this is going to be a very important one. So, um, using colligative properties. So first one we'll go over is uh, vapor pressure. And so um, with vapor pressure, let's just take a second to remember what the heck vapor pressure was. So vapor pressure, remember, uh, if you have a liquid in a sealed container, you know, of course, that liquid has all these molecules, but you're also going to have a few of them up in the gas phase, right, uh, above your liquid. So just some of them will have escaped, uh, and so you'll have ones that have enough kinetic energy to break their bonds, uh, interlocular bonds, and jump out of the solution, right? Um, it turns out that if you throw in a solute... The solute shall be purple. No, I used dark blue for this. You will end up decreasing uh, your uh, vapor pressure. Why do we think that is? Why do you think that uh, adding a solute would lower our vapor pressure once equilibrium is established? Reason, of course, like many other things, is more intermolecular forces, right? Because now there's something new and exciting for these water molecules or whatever solvent molecules to interact with. And as a result, fewer of them are going to be in the gas phase because now we have an additional intermolecular force we're putting in. So fewer molecules will have enough energy to break free of all those forces. So we're essentially just kind of moving our threshold of how much kinetic energy molecules will need to escape into the gas phase uh, to break out of those intermolecular forces. Exactly. So not technically escape velocity, but kind of escape velocity. Yeah. <laughs> technically a different term, but whatever, it works. So that's exactly right. So the more intermolecular forces you have, you end up with lower vapor pressure because uh, more kinetic energy is required to break them. Yeah, that's really awful. So uh, more forces to break, that moves our threshold over. So here's our kinetic energy plot, as always. You know, maybe uh, in, uh, let's use green and purple. Yeah, that'll work. So maybe in the green uh, scenario, this was kind of the amount of energy 
we would need to break to break the IMFs. Maybe it was at that point, right? Uh, so remember, this is the kind of proportion of molecules, and this is kinetic energy. Uh, once we throw in our, sol our solute, maybe now our threshold is here. So we will have basically just moved it over so that only now a small portion of these molecules will have enough energy to get out. Whereas before we had uh, the green and the purple, we had both of those sections. Again, this is all just like kind of statistics, but it works out. Dropped the stylus. Okay, there we go. We have a fun law for this, Raoult's law. Uh, which tells us how to calculate uh, the vapor pressure. So your vapor pressure uh, will, for your solution, for the solvent in your solution, is going to be the mole fraction of your solvent times the uh, original vapor pressure. Uh, I'll write that. So um, for your pure solvent, that is. Uh, so whatever your mole fraction is of your solvent, uh, that would be um, multiplied by the vapor pressure of your pure solvent, and you would end up with the vapor pressure of your solution uh, as a result. We can, uh, we actually have done a, We've done a mole fraction already, right? All right, we saw that the mole fraction of sucrose in this previous example was 0 0.00404. If the solute was, what's gonna be the mole fraction of the solvent? Assuming one solute. Uh, well, should be just one minus the solute, right? Because mole fraction uh, can't be more than one. So we're going to see that in this case, it's going to be 0 0.99596, I think. Kevin, double check. Just doing mental math there. And let's look at the uh, vapor pressure of water. Let's see. Vapor pressure of water at, I don't know, how about 30 degrees Celsius? Okay. Vapor pressure of water is 31.8 torr. Just looking that up. Okay, awesome. I'm glad we got that. Okay. So if we want to see what the vapor pressure is of our solution, we would have 0 0.99596 times 31.8 torr. And so we would do that, 0.99596. As you can see, this is not going to be of huge difference. Um, with sig figs, in fact, it's just 3.8. 31.7 torr. Uh, kind of sucks because this is a pretty dilute solution. Uh, so as a result, we're not going to see a huge difference. But lo and behold, there it is. We have a uh, smaller vapor pressure uh, having added our solvent in. Or solute, rather. So uh, obviously, the more solute you put in, as you can imagine, uh, the lower your vapor pressure is going to go. Uh, because you're going to be decreasing your mole fraction uh, of your solvent. So let's just write that down. More solute. Decreases your mole fraction, which will uh, decrease your vapor pressure as a result. So the more uh, solute you put in, the lower your vapor pressure is going to be. 
Uh, note that this only works for non-volatile solutes in volatile solvents. Do we remember what volatile means? We'll remember, we'll just write that down. Technically it means like easily boiled. It means relatively low boiling point. Yeah, so it evaporates easily, right? So um, for sugar, it's boiling point is, I don't know, 3000 degrees Celsius, whereas water is 100 degrees Celsius. So sugar is not going to be a, a volatile solute, so we'll be okay. However, if we were to put ethanol or something in here, that would really mess up our things because ethanol is a volatile solute. So we can't use uh, Raoult's law for that. Um, in fact, all these colligative properties are going to be kind of given this purple condition here uh, that we're going to have non-volatile solutes. All right, so for, for all the examples that we're going to do, we're just going to assume that our solutes are non-volatile. Um, so we won't have to really worry about that, but this is a, a kind of important distinction to make uh, just in case. Uh, as soon as you make throw in a volatile uh, solute, you start going into distillation theory, and that's going to be a whole other monster that we'll cover in OCHEM. So uh, we don't want to worry about that. So uh, for now, all of our solutes will be non-volatile. Hooray. Alrighty. We also know, colligatively speaking, that uh, we have two other um, important aspects. When you introduce a solute into your solution, you end up lowering your freezing point and increasing your boiling point. Um, so remember that boiling point is defined when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Maybe we remember that. I'll just write that out. The boiling point is the temp when your uh, vapor pressure or solvent, whichever one, or I'll just write vapor, is, is equal to atmospheric pressure. So um, remember that boiling point will change on elevation because that's when you can change the atmospheric pressure. Um, but we've just seen that we can mess with the vapor pressure. Remember that adding solutes make your vapor pressure go down, which means you need to increase the temperature more to get more of that uh, uh, particle into the uh, gas phase so that it can equal the atmospheric pressure. So that's why your boiling point will go up because you're, uh, you're adding intermolecular forces. That's what's going to need to be overcome by your temperature. So your boiling point will go up when you put solvents in. Solutes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> On the other hand, your freezing point goes down, and this is a different reason. If we think about uh, how um, something freezes, here's our liquid. We, you know, we're kind of going, assuming this is a crystalline solid, we're going from a kind of disorganized state into an orderly one uh, where we are, we're going to isolate our intermolecular forces, right? Um, however, once we throw in our solute, non-volatile one, of course, actually it doesn't really matter here, but still it's non-volatile, you're going to get some of these that kind of do that, but then some of them are still like, hey, 
I like this green thing over here. And so some of yours were still going to be attracted to that green uh, solute uh, instead of kind of organizing into their nice structures. So uh, eventually you'll get it so where you can incorporate the green thing into your crystal structure. But um, that's kind of the idea here is this kind of interferes with the normal process of uh, crystallization. So um, with that, hi little dude, um, you'll end up kind of lowering, yeah, it's kind of like a slush, right? So we're gonna see that this is important because you can throw your calcium chloride onto your snowy roads. Um, not really a thing we have in California. Well, maybe in like Tehachapi, I think you guys get snow out there, but um, you'll salt the roads to, to kind of uh, force this to happen. Um, and so uh, it's also the reason that when you put your vodka in the freezer, it does not freeze. Um, because of this uh, property of uh, this happening. And we can actually figure out what these are going to be. Your change in boiling point, delta Tb, is equal to, we'll talk about I in just a second, Uh, there's a constant called an ebullioscopic constant. It's a fun word. Most people just say boiling point elevation constant. I'll throw the word out there. We like that word, though. Ebullioscopic constant. You will not need to be able to spell this word. Uh, that's what this is, or simply just call it the boiling point constant. Uh, and then the molality there. So this uh, pesky I term we'll talk about in just a second, but let's talk about the uh, freezing point next. Um, I kind of go back and forth on this technical, this formula. Um, technically, it's negative I times Kf times m. Sometimes kf is given as a negative number, sometimes it's given as a positive number. Um, so it just depends. You want the overall term to be negative though, because you're you're decreasing your uh, temperature. That's, that's going to be freezing. So your whole thing should be negative. Some people put the negative in the formula. Some people put the negative on the constant. Doesn't really matter, but it should be negative at the end of the day. So um, this one, the, the word is a little easier. It is called the cryoscopic constant. Cryo means freezing. Uh, these two are different uh, constants. For different solvents, they would have different values. Uh, for water, for example, I know those off the top of my head, maybe. For water, it's 0 0.512 degrees C per molal. For water for freezing, it's 1.86 degrees C per molal. Alrighty, so those it's it's a really the same formula. You just use a different constant and throw in a negative sign. Easy. Um, this one, of course, by the way, is the change in freezing point. Freezing point there, or melting point, whichever one you want to call it. Uh, and uh, so we're going to see that uh, with the solution, you're going to just kind of expand the range that it's going to be a liquid, basically. That's the idea. Uh, let's go ahead and look at that uh, solution that we did earlier. But let me talk about this pesky eye thing. It is what is known as the Van Hoff factor. Um, and what it describes is the number of particles formed in solution. For example, we know that if we dissolve sodium chloride, we end up with uh, a sodium and a chloride, right? So for this, I would be approximately 2. 
for something like sucrose. Does not, it, when it dissolves, it does not break apart. So I is just going to equal one. So for your ionic things, when they break apart, the number of particles you get out would be approximately your Vantoff factor. Uh, if we look at, for example, aluminum bromide, that's going to break into an aluminum plus three bromides. And so we would get four as our Vantoff factor. Uh, you're noticing perhaps that I'm putting an approximate uh, sign there um, because uh, this approximation works well for when your solution is dilute and if your solution is water, solvent is water, I'm sorry. But if you have a concentrated solution or a different solvent, uh, these can be way, way smaller. Uh, the reason for that is the more you have as a concentrated solution, the more likely your particles are to be close enough together that they don't act as two separate particles. So um, just the more sodiums and chlorides you have in there, the more likely a sodium and a chloride will still be close enough to each other to kind of negate each other, if that kind of makes sense. So um, I'll just put a note there. Uh, for us, we're going to use these approximations. Um, we're not really going to worry about them uh, too, too much. So, but just understand that for, so I is approximately equal to number of particles or our ions when the solution is dilute and and water is the solvent. Uh, and then it I goes down quite a bit when the solution is concentrated. So, uh, you know, in reality, maybe uh, if you have an I of you know, two for sodium chloride, maybe in a more concentration concentrated solution, it's maybe like 1.5 instead of two. Um, but not something we're necessarily going to worry about. This is something you can do on homework. We can calculate the I uh, after we know the, uh, you know, freezing point and boiling point and all that stuff. We could calculate what the real I is. But uh, for now, for at least for this part, uh, just understand that I is approximately the whole number of ions when it's dilute and in water. So, but thankfully, because we're using sucrose as our solute for all that other stuff, uh, its I is just one. It does not break apart anyway, so who cares? We don't have to worry about it. Uh, let's go ahead and do uh, figure out what the uh, freezing point and boiling point of our um, sugar solution is going to be. So, remember, let's do the boiling point first. That's I times Kb, times the molality of the solution. Remember that delta, that's going to be final minus initial, or perhaps a little bit more easy for us would be kind of the like pure solvent. And then this is going to be kind of like the, the new one. So the TF is kind of what we're solving for here. So remember, delta always is final minus initial, but for us, it's kind of like the new one minus the old one. All right, so knowing uh, that I've given you the constant, it's a constant will be provided for you or you'll be calculating the constant yourself given enough information. For this, we have one times 0 0.512 times the molality. I'm gonna have to scroll up real quick see what the heck that was. It's a good thing we did all of these calculations, right? Molality, where are you? Okay, 0. 0.225. Okay, sorry. Didn't remember it. So we had that number already. We'd already calculated it. We're just using the same example solution for all of these different things. So if we do this, 0. 0.512 times 0. 0.225, not a huge difference. The change in boiling point is 0 
1152. Looks like we have three sig figs. Notice molality cancels out. If we uh, plug in our deltas, we have the new temperature minus 100. Let's just say that 100 is an exact number. Let's not worry about the, the decimals there. And so our new boiling point will be 100.115 degrees Celsius. Not a huge difference, right? Because uh, again, this is a pretty dilute solution. Um, but that's okay, we did it. Questions on that one? KB given to us, a bilioscopic constant. Ah, fun word. Impress your friends, by the way, with that. Uh, and the molality we already calculated earlier. And I is one because this is a mo molecule, it's not an ion, so we don't have to worry about it breaking apart into different things. Oh, oh wait, that's TF, T final, sorry. I got, I got confused, I was like, oh no, freezing point. So this is the new boiling point. Alrighty, if we look at the other one, freezing point now. Uh, times the molality. That's just going to equal negative 1 times 1 1.86. Remember, that's a constant. I've already given it to you. I would give it to you again uh, if it's needed, but I'm just taking that from the above uh, information. And then we have our 0.225 molal. So let's go ahead and take a look. So 1.86 times 0.225. Awesome, I got that as well. So the difference will be negative 0.4185 uh, with three sig figs. Uh, remember a normal freezing point for water would be zero. Uh, so the new freezing point is just the same thing. Uh, and so this is one reason that you would probably use an ionic uh, solid uh, as your choice for defrosting roads uh, is because that Van Hoff factor can make this more of an effect. Um, and so we can uh, do things with that. Cool. Was that the fourth one that we did, or is that the third colligative property? No, we have not talked about osmotic pressure yet. Alrighty, cool. We have one more to do, which is osmotic pressure. So first, we have to kind of discuss osmosis for a bit. Um, osmosis is the movement of water along a membrane uh, that is semi-permeable. So things can move across the membrane, water being one of them, not all things though. Um, and water will try and move uh, kind of where two, two more concentrated solutions. So it will move from an area that has less concentrated uh, solution to an area that has more concentrated solution because it wants to make those intermolecular forces. Right? It's just like the vapor pressure uh, example where we had kind of, um, you know, we threw in a solute, we made something more concentrated, we ended up drawing more water in there. It's interesting, osmosis can actually occur through the air as well. If you take a sealed container and have like two liquids in there, one concentrated, one dilute, or just pure water, the water will actually uh, evaporate and then uh, deposit itself into the concentrated solution. So you can actually get um, pretty interesting things to happen over time. Uh, here I can draw it, but you'd have to have a sealed container. So here's our, our jar here. If we have the 
this is our concentrated one. Actually, no, we're going to make the right one more concentrated. What will happen over time We will end up losing water there, and we are going to end up filling out this one more. It's pretty cool. Um, and so there's a pressure here that's kind of the driving force behind it. Uh, and we can calculate that pressure, which is denoted with a capital pi. We've got four terms this time. And look, it's our favorite gas law things. We're now having R and T back in here. So uh, you're going to see that this, of course, depends on temperature as a result. So um, let's say, I think we said 30 degrees Celsius was where our, solu our sugar solution was. Let's go ahead and calculate its osmotic pressure. Uh, R, of course, is... Uh, our universal gas constant, and temp T is temperature in Kelvin. So, for our sugar solution, we have 1 times the molarity was, what, 0.217, I think? Actually, I guess we should write moles per liter so that our units will cancel out nicely. All right, goodbye temperature, you're in my way. And so that'll be 303 Kelvin, something like that. Notice units, moles, liters, Kelvin. We're left with atmospheres, which is a pressure unit. 0.217 times 0 0.08206 times 303. And we get that this solution will have an osmotic pressure of, go away, 5.4. Four zero atmospheres. Yes, awesome. It, it's, I'm so glad when Kevin and I get the same thing. It makes things a lot easier. Uh, and so that would be the osmotic pressure of the solution. For your reference, uh, the osmo uh, osmotic pressure of blood is 7.7 .7 atmospheres. So uh, in fact, if we were to take this uh, sugar solution and we were to put some cells into it or something, uh, the water would actually uh, go from this solution into those cells, causing them to swell up. Uh, and this is actually apparently something you can do at home, which is pretty cool. Take an egg, dissolve its shell in vinegar so that you're left with the membrane around the egg. So just put the egg in the vinegar, it'll, it'll dissolve the shell. Uh, once you do that, take it, take that egg and uh, put it into different solutions. You can put it into pure water and watch the egg swell up or you can put it in really salty or sugary water and you'll watch that egg shrivel up uh, as the water is moving uh, across that membrane there. Uh, and it's a pretty cool, like kind of fun experiment you can do at home. And so, um, yeah. So with this, um, next time we will talk about how to use these uh, colligative properties to find molar mass. We'll do a few examples of that. Uh, and then we'll talk about colloids and then we're done with the solutions chapter. So, um, It'll be exciting. So we'll have that on Monday. And so on Monday, I'll assign some homework to you guys. Uh, and then actually, I'll probably assign it sooner rather than later. And then you can start working on the ones that we've covered so far. Um, but it'll be due next week. Um, last thing, if you are interested in the uh, honors thing tomorrow, how that's going to work is you will pop over to Discord at 1130. And you will join this lovely honors lounge, which I can't seem to do on this tablet right now. But what you would do is you just click the honors lounge thing there and uh, you would be able to go that. And tomorrow we're just going to talk about kind of the expectations. We'll see how many people are interested in it uh, and, and that. So um, just.
just show up there at 11.30 tomorrow if you're interested, and we'll just talk in Discord. So we're not going to have Twitch for that. We're just going to talk in Discord. If you want, uh, in, in that, you can... Um, we'll wait, tablet. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, with that... <laughs> I've just closed it. Whatever. Forget it. Um, with that, you can choose to do a video or just audio chat. Doesn't really matter to me. Um, I'll be there probably with video, but we'll see. Um, and with that, uh, I'll guess I'll see some of you tomorrow if you're interested. Uh, unfortunately, that one is a scheduled thing, so uh, that has to be uh, that meeting time. So if you can't make it, unfortunately, uh, you're not going to be able to do the honors uh, for this uh, particular class. So, uh, yeah. Alrighty, well, um, with that, um, yeah, I guess that's it. So I'll see you either tomorrow or Monday. Have a great weekend otherwise. Uh, and yeah, take care. <laughs>